Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. Thank you for being here on a public holiday for today's JCI Forum, held in conjunction with the launch of the Roundtable Special Issue on Regime Change in Malaysia. To open our proceedings today, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Venka Iyer, editor of the Roundtable, to say a few words. Thank you, Derek, and a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm very heartened by the presence of so many of you on, as Derek was saying, a public holiday. Um, I'm not going to be very long, just to introduce the round table, which is one of the sponsors of this event. The round table is uh, a journal as well as an organization. Uh, what the journal does is uh, analyze, comment on uh, international affairs in relation to the Commonwealth. So our focus is the Commonwealth. Uh, it is the oldest uh, foreign affairs journal, at least in the United Kingdom, founded in uh, 1910. Uh, and we've been in continuous publication ever since. Uh, the journal comes out uh, six times a year. Uh, and we also have, as well as general issues, special issues on either uh, a certain theme or on uh, a region, uh, but uh, the, 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 the thread running through all this is uh, uh, a connection with the Commonwealth. Uh, and in that context, of course, we are today launching uh, one of our special issues, which is on the uh, last general election in Malaysia. So the special issue is formally titled Regime Change in Malaysia GE14 and its importance, and this is how it looks. We do not at the moment have hard copies of the journal to distribute, but our publishers have very kindly allowed us to give out a code to all of you, which will enable you to access the journal online free of charge for the next one month. And that code, I think, is uh, being flashed on the screen behind me. Uh, if for any reason you have not captured the code, then do let one of us know, and we will be very happy to provide it to you. Um, I also would like, before I sit down, to thank a number of people who have been um, associated with this uh, special issue and with the organization of um, today's function. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, the guest editors of the special issue, uh, Dr. Chinua Wong and uh, uh, Dr. Ki Bang Wee. Um, they have done a very good job of producing this special issue within a very short time frame. Um, the issue itself is quite chunky. There are uh, nine articles, full-length articles, and about 16 opinion pieces. So even by the standards of our special issues, uh, this is quite substantial. Incidentally, the uh, special issues of the round table are quite popular, so much so that uh, uh, the waiting list for special issues now extends to 2021. So if any of you came up with an idea for a special issue, I'll have to slot it for some time in 2021. Uh, so that's how uh, things are. Uh, please feel free, if you have an idea, as long as it has a connection with the Commonwealth, to suggest a special issue, what we do is we give complete freedom to the person selected as a guest editor to commission articles, to edit articles, and to put together the special issue. And very often, uh, the special issue is followed by uh, launch functions, such as the one being held today. I would also like to thank the Jafrichia Institute for hosting this event uh, Professor Wu uh, Wing Tai uh, has been instrumental in letting that happen, and he has a very dedicated team of um, 
administrators and supporters, including Derek, who opened the proceedings today. And I want to pay a special tribute to Derek, who's been absolutely wonderful in terms of uh, giving us all the support that we needed. Um, I must also uh, recognize the excellent effort made by Mr. Radhakrishnan, who is usually quite uh, shy and retiring. Um, he was uh, able to generate a lot of interest for this event, particularly in the diplomatic community. And uh, so I'm very grateful to him for that. And finally, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, Professor Paul Carmichael, uh, who has, uh, uh, in a sense, accidentally been able to be with us today. Uh, Paul, of course, has also very graciously agreed to moderate the panel discussion that's going to follow. So you'll hear more from him shortly. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything more except to encourage all of you, particularly uh, younger members of the audience, of whom I can see quite a few, to consider writing for the round table. Uh, and I'm not talking here about special issues. I'm just talking about articles and opinion pieces, uh, which are very welcome. So uh, I hope you will respond to that uh, call. Uh, do uh, drop me a line. My details <coughs> are in the um, journal itself, <coughs> to which, as I said, you will have access. So I will, at this stage, stop and um, hand the floor over to uh, whoever is going to follow me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. I would like now to invite Dr. Wong Chin Huat as one of the guest editors to say a few words about this special issue. Good afternoon. On behalf of my co-editor, Dr. Wiki Bing and uh, Wenkat, thank you so much for coming, uh, for sharing, attending this launch of the special issue. We all know that Malaysia always makes news for the wrong reason. But this year, when the whole world gets it wrong on so many things, we finally got it right. And, and it's our privilege and honor to have a special issue on the round table, the Commonwealth Journal of International Affairs, specially dedicated to the elections and its aftermath. Where do we go from here? <coughs> and uh, the idea started slightly before general elections when uh, Dr. Wenka uh, I, uh, approached us to discuss the possibility. And immediately after that, as everyone tried to sing in and figure out what happens and what to make sense of the changes and so on, we reach out to our writers and uh, get them to write. And of course, that process is quite challenging because that at the same time, many of our writers actually have other uh, other documentations to do as well. As we all know, there, there are at least two other more projects on uh, academic provocations on the, the, on the general election. Uh, to cut the story short, that we have quite a bit of, uh, a bit of stress, a bit of challenges in, in getting through this, this special issue, not least because of his, his uh, extent. We have eight peer review academic articles and 17 opinion pieces. So what I'll do now briefly is to run through what are the things that we have collected in this special issue. The first article is, uh, is by Dr. Serena Raman from IC Singapore. She wrote on Malay tsunami. Was it a Malay tsunami? And we will recommend you to read this together with three opinion pieces, starting from uh, that, the piece from YB Chintong, uh, Liu Chintong, who first coined the word, or at least popularized it, uh, Malay Tsunami. Together, we've also uh, a piece by Chan Kok Leong from the Malaysian Inside, and uh, Ben Ibrahim Sufian from Medega Center, to, to diagnose why did so many people get it wrong? There was not, uh, there was not, uh, there was not a Malay tsunami. They got it wrong that eventually we actually saw one. So you would like to follow the debates on that. Next, we actually have also uh, Professor Ahmad Fauzi from USM dissecting the Islamist factor, looking into the different camps of Islamists across the party divide. Uh, 
After that, we have the political legal mobilization of ethnic Indians before GE14. This is by Dr. Tatcha Yini Ka, uh, Kananatu from uh, Monash University, Malaysia, just across the road. And this article is particularly useful if you want to understand what happened with the riot around the Tim uh, Hindu temple recently, which is also uh, within uh, this area. The fourth article was on the China factor by Dr. Amrita Mahe uh, of the Australian National University. Unlike some people's perception that the election was a referendum from China factor to vote yes or no against China influence, uh, Dr. Mahi very intelligently argued that this was actually a, a, a smart play on the Pakatan side to respond to this threat of Chinese posed by Barisan National. Because the Chinese threat is framed now, was framed now as China externally rather than the Chinese internally. And then this is followed by uh, a piece by Dr. Nelson Ian Massad from Unimas on the Sarawak Dayak shift. We know that six inland constituency fell to Pakatan Harapan and independent candidates. What were the factors that caused this surprise? It wasn't as big as Malay tsunami, but nonetheless, still significant. And then we have an article on patronage, whether would that stay with the outstings of Barisan National this is by Dr. Sebastian Detman and Dr. Meredith Weiss. Uh, this is then followed by my article on the rise, resilience, and demise of Malaysia dominance coalition. So I'll argue from a systemic point of view going back to history that how Barisan National came about and why it collapsed eventually. And the last academic article was from my colleague, uh, from our colleague, Pei Jung, Yong Pei Jung from Penang Institute, on gender and uh, on women under representation in election, parliament, and uh, cabinet. And as I mentioned, that we have a series of opinion pieces by observer, by uh, practitioners by activists. I have introduced three of them just now by Chin Tong, uh, Kok Leong, and Ban. The others are one of them by uh, Professor Terence Gomez and Dr. Uh, Pon Mala Alagapa on the few broker state. Why did, to further explain why the Malaysian Indian poor would move away from Barisan National. Uh, and Malay, to talk about the GE14, you cannot ignore the factors of 1MDB. So we have two pieces on this matter, and both were actually newsmaker. They were supposed to be news reporter, but they also newsmaker in this. One is uh, Claire Brown, the editor of Sarawak Report, and the other is uh, Mr. Uh, Hokei Tat the publishers of the H Media Group. And then we have four articles going into electoral malpractices and reform. We have Datuk Sri Ambiga and her colleague Lim Wei Jet on constituency delineation, how the Slango attempt has successfully delayed the election. And we have uh, an analysis of electoral fraud by uh, Xia Hongyi and followed by another account on, uh, on voting and counting on the ground. 
we have seasoned counting agents trainer uh, Vitak, who is here, providing a first-hand account. And we have another account by Sharu Aman, the former acting chair of Bursi during the election on misconduct in campaign period. So from vote buying to abuse of government uh, apparatus and so on, based on the observation report compiled by Berse, Swaram and Pusat Komas. And we have Professor Andrew Harding offering his advice on what reform we should undertake in electoral management as well as government formation. The next batch of articles revolve around the team of reform. We have the Deputy Law Minister, uh, that, uh, YB Hanipa Maidin, explaining the political significance of the, first, of the appointment of Tommy Thomas as Malaysia's first minority uh, a, a, uh, attorney general. And a critical review from Professor Amanda Whiting on human rights in post-transition Malaysia. On the economic front, Professor Wing Tai argued that Malaysia should embark on decentralization on a few aspects, including uh, banking and uh, d d development. We have also an account by YB Maria Chin Abdullah, the former chairperson of Bursay, on her journey from the street fighters pushing for change on the street and eventually getting into the House of Parliament. Next, we have a reflections on how civil society groups should respond to the post-transition circumstance where the government become friendlier, um, opposition weaker, and communal politics remain toxic. This is by Thomas Fan, the new chairperson of Bursay 2.0. And lastly, we have a piece that helped us to reflect what happened in the past 20 years, starting from 1998 most befittingly by someone, a politician that was shaped by the changes in the last 20 years, who is also one of our panelists today, YB Nuru Iza. So we have this collection of eight peer-reviewed academic journals and 17 opinion pieces by practitioners, observers, activists. We, uh, the collection is certainly not exhaustive. We can certainly find there are many issues we want to cover, but that would get uh, the editor go bust because for exceeding the page number, we have to pay a fine nowadays. <laughs> so we have to stop with this, but, uh, but I hope the collection here would help us to get a more sober understanding of what happened and what would happen next. This is particularly important after the anti isid rally on the Saturday and uh, some developments immediately after that, including the Prime Minister announcement to not have local elections yesterday. It's important for us to realise that uh, what shaped that election, what in the past has shaped elections and how our actions and choices may shape our future. And I would like to dedicate uh, the thanks, our utmost uh, gratitude to our uh, writers, as well as uh, the production team at the round table in UK who have to live with uh, a few rounds of revisions and delays and other stresses. 
And, and personally, I must thank uh, my co-editor as well as my boss, Dr. Uiki Bing, uh, for the editing part, especially on language. Whatever that's good comes from him. And uh, without Wingcut's kind general uh, invitation, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have this collection. And for today's event, of course, Professor Wu and all the staff from uh, Sunway University, thank you. And we hope you enjoy reading this. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Indeed, six months have passed since a historic general election. So what progress have we made and what challenges stand in the way of building this new Malaysia? We are privileged today to have some of the contributors to the roundtable special issue to discuss some of these questions. Our apologies, however, that Mr. Wan Saiful will not be able to make it today, but rest assured that YB Nurul Iza is on her way right now as we speak. May I invite on stage our panelists for the day, uh, Dr. Wong, who is here already, YB Liu Chin Tong, Professor Wu Wing Tai, and our moderator for the day, Professor Paul Carmichael from Ulster University. Professor Carmichael, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Sunway for this roundtable discussion. Uh, I should say, by way of introduction, in my role as Associate Dean for Global Engagement at Ulster University, it's a privilege for me in several respects coming to uh, Malaysia. Firstly, because of my role in building international links between the university with other distinguished universities around the world, such as Sunway, but also um, on foot of Dr. Ayer's invitation uh, to chair this afternoon's uh, pr proceedings or to moderate them. Um, it's an additional fascination because my background as a subject specialist is in public administration and political science. And therefore, it was with a degree of uh, great humility, but also pleasure that I was able to accept the invitation to uh, moderate the proceedings because of the fascination in uh, the topic which we're about to discuss. And coming from the United Kingdom at a time of its own um, uh, recent tsunami and potential tsunami in relation to an issue which affects our part of, of the UK, namely Northern Ireland particularly uh, so, um, it's almost refreshing to come to somewhere else in the world and focus <laughs> on, on, on somebody else's issues and problems. Um, but no doubt we, we will learn something and who knows, perhaps even make some connections between our respective uh, countries. But without further ado, let me um, turn to our panel and perhaps I could start by asking each of our uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, contributors for their own analysis of, of what are the causes of what have been described by many observers as a tsunami uh, that swept the, um, the, the government so decisively from power uh, earlier this year. So I'd be grateful if each of you could perhaps take no more than five minutes um, to make your introductory uh, comments. And um, as moderator, I'm reliably informed that I have um, uh, chair's discretion to guillotine our, not literally understand our guests and in the interests of timekeeping and in interests of fairness and also to ensure that there's an opportunity in due course for members of the audience to pose questions of our distinguished guests. So perhaps if I could invite our, uh, our uh, De Deputy Defence Minister, uh, sir, would you perhaps uh, like to uh, be first to the rostrum to give your um, uh, analysis? Since uh, I'm not given too much time, I, let me share with you uh, a personal story. I grew up in Subang Jaya, but my first term, uh, I was elected in Penang, in Bukit Bandera. I contested in Penang because at that time, uh, everyone said that uh, you're so young and um, that seat, uh, you're not going to win that seat, so it's okay, you just go there to uh, sacrifice. <laughs> and in my second term, I contested in Kluang, Johor. Um, everyone say, are you serious? But I say, okay, let's try. Um, they say, okay, good luck. And I, I won. And of course, this round, uh, I went to Aitam. They say, uh, yeah, good luck. And uh, indeed, I didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> Barisan National peaked in 2004. 
Barisan Nasional peaked in 2004, and subsequently, it took Malaysians three elections to defeat Barisan Nasional. Now, in these three elections, in 2008, essentially, it was very much an urban non-Malay swing against Barisan Nasional. And in 2013, you also see some swing, but very marginal, from among urban Malays. But 2013, essentially, I would say, was the swing among rural non-Malays, particularly, for instance, ethnic Chinese voters in Johor, a swing against Barisan National by rural Chinese in 2013. And in this election, you see also swing in supposedly rural seats among Malays. That means Barisan National lost in areas in which they thought it was their fixed deposit. What happened? I have a bit of bragging right when I can come here and say that uh, you all got it wrong, I got it right. <laughs> One major factor is very few Malaysians want to accept this reality that we are indeed very urban. If you look at the statistics, 74% in 74% of Malaysians, well, based on 2017, 74 75 percent Malaysians are urban uh, residents. Actually, if you look at look deeper, 70% of Malays are actually living in urban areas. Except that, like those voters in Kluang that I represented in 2013, many of them actually vote in Kluang but actually stay in KL or Singapore. I used to joke that uh, in my previous constituency, on a weekday, the average age is 55, weekend 25, on Chinese New Year or Hari Raya, the average age is 15. Now, the relevance is not just for that election. That election, I think many people got it wrong because they failed to recognize that Malaysia is an urban nation where most people communicated through WhatsApp. The, de the debate and the battle happened on WhatsApp and it didn't really matter so much in the rural or semi-urban constituencies, in the sense that the ground has not shifted too much there in the rural area or in the semi-urban areas, but the ground in, the, in, in this 70, 80% of people who are tuned in to national discourse, they swung. And they swung, and because they swung, the nation, nation swung to defeat Najib. So these are relevance, uh, relevant lessons that, that are important for us moving forward. Moving forward, I think we must be able to see that we are no longer the nation that, we, that the rhetoric, rhetoric try to see. But of course, this is not an easy job. To defeat Najib and do, to defeat Barisan National wasn't easy. But it was easy to articulate because uh, it's easy to say that you have a common enemy. Now is the harder part. How to build a new nation based on something in common? Based on something in common, based on something that most people share. I think this is a challenge. I want to draw your attention back to Vision 2020. Over the last 60 years in Malaysian history, there was a period of time, there was a period of, of about 14 years between, 2000, between 1991 and about 2005 when Hisham waved the crease. There was a period of 14 years of time when Malaysians thought we're more Malaysian than our own identity because the central narrative of the time was about Bangsa Malaysia. It doesn't mean that ethnicity goes away, but the center had a narrative. 
And that narrative was Bangsa Malaysia Vision 2020. Of course, uh, along the way, see, I have made this joke quite often, but uh, I don't know whether I should make this now. Because along the way, during that period of time, whenever Mahathir needed an enemy, it wasn't from internal. It was either the US, the Jews, uh, the British, the Australians, and the most convenient Singapore. I hope I didn't say anything. <laughs> but the point is, nation building happened before. In, in, it has its defects. But moving forward, I think we need a central narrative. I think we need a central na narrative. We need to have a narrative that actually brings together Malaysians. And that central nar narrative needs to take into consideration that, number one, we are an urban nation. We are very much common in our experience that a Chinese hawker and a Malay hawker share very similar experience. An Indian taxi driver and, an, and a, Malay Indian, a Malay taxi driver share very interesting experience, a very similar experience. And being here is interesting in the sense that here was a location or within a kilometer was a location of a previous riot, Taman Medan. And within five kilometers is the recent riot, Seafield. We have to come back to the city to understand how to create an urban future for all Malaysians. Now, if we can create an urban future for all Malaysians, uh, we'll be able to articulate something that most will share. It doesn't mean that you will win the whole nation everywhere, and we will still need to acknowledge that we do have a rural sector, and we do have to take care of the rural sector. But having that central narrative based on needs, based on common experience, is important. But race and ethnicity will not necessarily go away easily. We will have to acknowledge. And I think to acknowledge that the bottom, out, of, out of the bottom 40%, 75% are Bumiputra, is a good start. To acknowledge that actually, yes, to a certain extent, most Bumiputra are in, in the bottom bracket. Or among the bottom 40% bracket, two-thirds are Bumiputra. It doesn't mean that we only help the bottom, but we help everyone at the bottom. But in order to uplift, to uplift the bottom 40% can be a national objective to begin with. And perhaps we can rethink the whole narrative. The narrative of uh, affirmative action in this country over the last 50 years was about equity. But equity only helps people at the top and in the name of the people at the bottom. I want to introduce another three E's that everyone actually knows. Equity, education, entrepreneurship, but more importantly, employment. Now, if we reverse the sequence and we look at employment for the bottom 40%, look at employment for the bottom 40%, look at how to improve wages and the quality of jobs for the bottom 40%, and from there, reverse the whole debate. I think that is somewhere, this is something that we can start in order to reverse the debate and find a common cause, common narrative to move forward. Thank you. We, 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 are, we are making progress telepathically, I gather, between our speakers. <laughs> it was one ends, the next moves. So Professor, Professor Wu, perhaps you would like to uh, offer your reflections. The question was, what are the things that helped bring about the big change that to, uh, for the new Malaysia? There are many reasons, and I think uh, when he talked about the shift in people's voting behavior was caused by different people got shifted for different reasons. And I would just emphasize one of them, which is the economic reasons for why people felt 
a change was necessary. The reason was economic stagnation. And let me uh, uh, elaborate a little bit. The source of political appeal of the previous regime was his promise to promote the economic well-being of the Pumiputra community. It is true that the previous government also told them, we, also, we give you the right to be able to lord over the other races, the Katuanan Melayu story. But I think that was a sideshow. The main source of political appeal was we will make your life better. And when that failed to materialize, I think that was the primary reason for the end. How can we see that it was not realizing? Mahathir promises Wawasan 2020, which is that we would reach the promised land in 2020. And Najib tells promises National Transformacy 2050. In a way, he just shifted the, 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 the promise of reaching the, 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 the commitment to reaching the promised land by 30 years. And that is a reflection of the fact that things were not going well. How do you measure economic stagnation? Because Anyone who knows any numbers would show that GNP per capita has been going up every year. And even the GNP per capita for the poorest 40% has been going up. That, however, is not the way that an educated, competent, ambitious population measures its progress. One way to be happy about your progress is by your own achievements. Another way is, is to have low expectations. I think we have over-educated ourselves to forego the second way of measuring achievements. So the relevant achievement is, where do we stand compared to the standard of living in the richest countries. In other words, are we growing faster than the growth rate of the richest countries? If we grow faster than that, then you see a narrowing of the gap. And there was such a narrowing of the gap. Malaysia was roughly 12% of US living standard in 1960. And since the 1970, that has continued to grow. In fact, we reach 30% of US standard of living by 1994. But what was it in 2014? We reached 30% in 1994. In 2014, we are still at 30%. So basically, it is true that our income has gone up higher, but our ability to afford the health care of the first world, our ability to obtain first world level education has not improved. And this sense of stagnation, I think, was the cause of the, fall, of the, down, of the downfall of the regime, especially when it was unable to offer new ideas and ideas and whatever new ideas it, it offered did not work. And so it ran back to the practice of doing more of the same. Like for example, he started the PIP program, the Pumiputra Economic Empowerment Program, in addition to what was done before. If that program has succeeded and it pushed the Pumiputra community up to a certain level, but then it was unable to push them up further to another level. And doing more of the same 
did not work. It's almost like the fo following. You got a headache, you call up the doctor at 12 midnight, and the doctor says, well, take four aspirins and you'll feel better. And at 4 a.m., you still don't feel better. So you call the doctor at 4 a.m. again. That the headache's not improved. The doctor has two choices. One is, why don't you try to take eight and see if it's better? Or the other choice is, maybe you don't have the kind of sickness that I think you had. So my five minutes leaves you with the question, what would be the formula that would work? And would the present government implement the new ideas that, that are workable? Thank you. And so to our third speaker, perhaps, sir. It's good to have a second chance immediately. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, following what uh, Chin Tong and Bing Tai have said, I want to argue that the challenge, what happened on May 9 was a series of unexpected consequences. The, f the seed of fall, uh, of BN's fall, lie in its landslide in 2004. When it won 91% of seats with 64% of votes, that sent the regime into trouble. Why? The regime was not designed to deal with competition. So when it won so many seats, left with 20 seats out there, the 20 seats, far at 10, won by DAP, six by PASS, three by PBS in Sabah, and one by one Aziza in Pematang Pau. When, when, when BN won with, left with only 20 seats, the spoils were inside. So the warlords in BN start turning in. They start fighting each other. So what Chin Tung explained of Hishamuddin uh, Hussein raising the careers is not something personal. He was not an extremist, a militant, a racist. He was responding to the incentives set by the system. Why? Because the game is won out there. What he needed to do was to climb up the ladder in the party. And the party is a Malay nationalist party. It pays him, it pay him no reward to be moderate. He would have to be, he would have to be nationalist. And the outcome of that was not really just a raising careers, but it's a reflection that the sense of invisibility in BN and the regime, and at the receiving, uh, the receiving end, was not the ethnic Chinese who were large enough to withstand that. They were not happy. At the receiving end was the Indian. And what you have at the end was Hindraf. We shook the regime. But the other side of the story was also because that when the party was so strong, Amno, the warlords in Amno, including Tun Dr. Mahade at that time, felt that they could actually bring down Abdullah without risking uh, the regime. At the end of the day, you have the tsunami. And what happened after the tsunami? The tsunami was not because that the people want to overthrow the government. They merely want to punish the government. But because the government was so strong, exactly because of that, the government survived with 30 seats in the parliament. And what caused the next trouble to the government was peace. Because the government has promised and say, if you dare to change the government, there would be riot. But there was no riot after 2008. That diminished the incentive for the minority to split their vote between the government and the opposition. And that's why you see the votes for BN drop from below 30% in 2008 to below 20% in 2013, and eventually around 10% in 2018. But the government was saved by another factor. When the Chinese became fearless of political change, that sent Malays into greater fear because we have no national consensus of what to have after overthrowing government. The Malays were fearful that NEP would come to an abrupt end. So that 
cause a swing back to Barisan National and save Barisan National in 2013, as what explained by Chin Tong. The story would have ended there, we would have lived in misery, but Najib did two things wrong for him, right for the country. Uh, as far as democratization is concerned, one, he imposed GST, which undo the ground of Malay support. It caused, every, it caused many people to be unhappy, but especially the Malays, because many of them, for the first time, they feel that they have to pay tax. And second thing was 1MDB, which sent Mahathir to opposition side. And that solved the opposition Malay problem. Why? Because that in the past, it's very easy to defend Barisan National and say they would sell out. That's the problem with Teng Razari, with Anwar Ibrahim. BN tried to do that again with Mahathir. But Mahathir was Mahaguru on Malay nationalism. So you can't sell that story. Eventually, he provided a pool that sing in all this. To me, that's the story. The question is then, can Barisan National, can Pakatan Harapan survive inheriting the same regime? If you want to look at the positive side, PH has what Barisan National did not have, balance of power between four parties. If you want to look at the negative side, that also means there's no stability because the system was not designed for political competitions. I would caution that we have not seen a new Malaysia yet. We are only seeing a Malaysia in transition. And for the country to move forward, the ultimate challenge, and in response to uh, Professor Wu's argument that can we move forward changing a new formula, the question we need to ponder upon is can, can we make political competition work? Can democracy work for Malaysia? Or more starkly, can Malaysia survive democracy? Because we were not democratic despite having elections since 1969. Thank you. Gentlemen, I wonder if um, I could uh, move to some specific questions and based on your respective contributions, perhaps start with um, the phrase um, tsunami has been used to describe the events around GE14. Now, um, some commentators have referred to it as precipitating a country reborn Based on your comments to date and perhaps some further reflections, perhaps I can ask you to say whether or not you believe that that election outcome has created a country reborn or is it really just a flash in the pan? So perhaps, um, perhaps I'll start with you, uh, 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 Um we, we have a question what the left would call the national question, unresolved since 1946. The year Amnu was born, and the year um, the British started to prepare for decolonization, that question is, can we be, can citizens be different yet equal? We have no solution to that question. And Malaysian politics, if you'd like, has been surrounding that question since then. And Malaysian politics has been resolved on that team since yet. The good thing about May 9 is that we have a new start. And it did not come with bloodshed. We have a smooth transition. That gives us the opportunity to restart. But I do not think pretending that we have come to the solution help. And if anything, the anti ISIS rally on last Saturday is a wake-up call. Okay, thank you. Um, Wing Tai, from, uh, you, you referred in your opening remarks to the, the economic realities and to quote a, a, the late departed uh, President Bush in the United States um, when it was said it's the economy stupid which cost him the presidency in 1992, applying that lesson to uh, the context here in Malaysia. Will the economic realities bear crucially on the success or otherwise of the new government and whether or not 
it, it's, its changes prove to be transitory or more permanent and durable? I see many differences between Mahatil 2.0 and Mahatil 1.0. Mm. I think Mahatil 1.0 was struck, was CC's goal as to institutionalize the economic improvement of the Malays. So he put in place a whole host of policies that did help to produce a very large Malay middle class. But now he has realized that that set of institutions which he had put in place, in particular the growth mechanisms that were put in place, were after lifting a large amount of Malays onto the middle class, that same kind of instruments was not capable of leaving mm. If mm. the remaining Malays up to the middle class and to lift the existing middle class further up, the upper middle class and high income. Mm. And that has to do with the, ins the economic instruments of economic empowerment along racial lines degenerated into instruments of corruption for the political elite. And once the instruments w were became one of uh, more interested in transferring income to the top 1% than helping the advancement of the bottom 40%, that was the problem. Mm -hmm. Why? And what was wrong was that this was recognized but there was a shortage of new ideas of how to come up with new instruments. And I think the Mahathir of today realizes the, that the warranty of the old instruments are expired, they're no longer effective, <laughs> and new instruments have to be adopted, and new instruments could only be adopted if there is a change in the, th in the economic uh, rationale for policies. And before I say what is the new economic rationale is, I would like to point out the new political uh, scenario in Malaysia. The big change is that from now onwards, the idea of one coalition controlling almost all of the states all but one. Like for example, only Kelantan is in the opposition state, but the rest are all under one coalition. I think those days are over. I think at any one point in time, there'll be a two to four states that would be in the hands of the opposition. And given the fact that central government power could change among parties, a, a, a party in central government today could end up just being a state government tomorrow. Mm. So you have to think, in, keep in mind, what kind of economic institutions do you want to set up such that if you happen to be voted out, you could bring about a rebirth later on through uh, while in the state government. And I see a desire to promote decentralization in Malaysia. Because decentralization, the simple word for it is the empowerment of the individual. That's what decentralization is. And what is the most important thing in solving a problem? You've got to have lots of ideas to choose from. There's always a shortage of good ideas. There's even a greater there's an even greater shortage of ideas that work. So how do you have more ideas? You've got to have more centers of policy initiatives. You want to have each state being able to implement 
policies that it thinks would work to promote itself. And if it works, all the other states would copy it. But in order for the states to be able to implement its own ideas of development, the process of experimentation that would tell us what are the ideas that would work, the state's got to have the revenue to be able to finance its development projects. So all the talk recently by let's say, Mukris in Canada calling for a greater dispersion of financial power to the state government, a greater role in responsibilities in provision of infrastructure education and health by the state governments means that the central government must stop being the boss of all decision making where the economic planning unit sets the one program that all 13 states follow. And what it means is if there's infrastructure to be, to be uh, provided, it could, it need not be provided through the government ministries, but through the state government. In other words, put the money to the states and let the states spend it in the areas that they identify as particularly important for them, rather than to give it to the ministries the way it is, and then the ministries pick and choose which state they want to spend it on. So the first thing is, we've got to have multiple centers of policy initiatives, and to enable these multiple centers of initiative to work, you've got to give them the revenue uh, to do so. And that is what we in economics call fiscal decentralization. And along with it is administrative decentralization. Mm -hmm. I would say, as we go along, I'll, I'll have more details on what other areas of decentralization besides in the administrative and governance structure. So, so Minister, uh, 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 in answering the question. Um, Defense is the only one area that cannot be centralized. <laughs> I, I would like to first touch on um, the term Malay tsunami. I was speaking at ANU in April 2015, just before Pakatan fell apart in June 2015. And in that speech, I say that I saw great, I saw a huge leadership vacuum because I detected that Malays hated Najib, both Najib and Hadi, and they were looking for new leadership. That was in 2015, April 2015. And by June, I came up, June, June 2015, I came up with the word Malay tsunami because I think the the then existing structure of having PAS and UMNO, the PAS and UMNO structure would not be able to attract sufficient Malay support. And they would, if, if the structure, if the structure cannot hold, could not hold, then the floodgate will open. And that was my argument at that, at that time. And at that time I was saying, now that was a time that no one thought it was possible. So at that time, back in June 2015, I was saying that when I define Malay tsunami, I, I say if there was a 15% swing among Malay votes, that means among Malay voters, <coughs> if, there, if there were 15% swing away from UMNO, that would mean Malay tsunami. Now, now you look back and say, ah, 15%, what is 15%? But 15% was huge, especially at the standpoint of June 2015. June 2015, everyone was talking about 1% swing, 2% swing. And the whole debate over three years, if you happen to read Nick Nasmi's uh, P, uh, book, the whole debate within Pakatan at that time for, for three years was about whether you can, whether, whether we should work with PASS or not work with PASS because um, there will be, uh, PASS could determine a 1 or 2% swing. But in June 2015, I say a 15% swing was possible. And that was what happened in 20, 2018. There was 
more than 15% swing away from UMNO. But in the West Coast, the swing away from UMNO manifested through vote for Pakatan Harapan. In the East Coast, it was manifested through a vote for PAS. So what comes out from that? It comes out from that is that PAS won significant number of seats in the East Coast. It won significant numbers of seats in a three-corner fight in East Coast because voters thought that it was easier to vote for PAS in order to defeat AMNO. Whereas in the West Coast, because of the multi-ethnic nature of West Coast seats, voters decided that it was easier to vote for Pakatan in order to defeat AMNO. Now, the lesson from all this is that the voters did not vote for Pakatan. The voter, voters voted against mm. Najib and Barisan National. Likewise, the voters, the middle ground voters did not vote for PAS. They voted for PAS in order to defeat Abno and Barisan mm. National. Moving into the future, um, since I predicted something, so let me predict, uh, make a few predictions. <laughs> I would like to predict that AMNO will further disintegrate and AMNO eventually will have no relevance in Malaysian politics. PAS will remain and PAS will remain a strong uh, regional force. PAS will continue to be a strong regional force. And whereas I think there is a room, there is a space for a new opposition to emerge, and that new opposition has to be better than Pakatan Harapan. It has to move one step further. Which means that my view is that moving forward, Pakatan could be replaced. Pakatan could be replaced, and Pakatan will, will at some point have to be replaced in a democracy, you, we will not rule for 60 years because we are now a democracy. The cycle would be faster. People will get upset and people will get uh, angry and get uh, disappointed much easier compared to previously because there's no fear of voting against the government anymore. Whereas fear factor play a very important role in all previous elections. But I would like to bet that if there is a change of government, it will not, Pakatan will not be replaced by AMNO or the existing Barisa National Parties. It will have to be replaced by a different party that promised to be better than Pakatan. And this is where, these are the predictions that I would like to make. So I think AMNO will further disintegrate and uh, will not be relevant in the next two or three years. Thank you. Okay, Chin, Chin Wat, you wanted to come back on that. Well, uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to share platform with Chin Tong. And uh, sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. And I would agree with him that Amnu's days are numbers. But, and I say this way before the election that uh, there will not be a two-party with just an outside of BN. BN would collapse. Uh, but I disagree that if PH get replaced, is the, sub, the, the substitution would necessarily be better. I have a very pessimistic view of Malaysian politics because of the structure. Why? Because of first past the post. People talk about two-party system as if you can actually have a two-party, a, a, a two-collation system here as if you have a two-party system in the UK. It, didn't, it did not materialize for a very simple reason. Parties would come together for two reasons, wood pooling or power sharing. So wood pooling would work where you are contesting in mixed constituency and you cannot get all the support you need. So the limitation to that 
incentive is that you have Kelantan and Tengganu at a big part of mm. inland constituencies that are monoethnic. So there's no reason for PAS or AMNO to actually want to go to the meter. Power sharing was actually more useful to get the party to go to the meter. That was why that PAS and DAP, uh, every time when they see AMNO in trouble, they would put aside their differences and come together. And the problem now is exactly that. For AMNO and PAS, they have no non-Malay or not even East Malaysian counterparts, potential counterparts to look at, allies to look for. They see no prospect in future. So they are going, they will only go further to the right. You can think of the Spider-Man's Spider -Man's uncle moral advice to him. With great power come great responsibility. Flip that over, without power, without prospect of power, there's no obligation to be obliged. Mm. So I would say that uh, it's very likely that PAS would absorb AMNO and become the main threat to Pakatan here. In East Malaysia, GPS, the Sarawak Coalition, and GPS, the, the about to emerge Sabah Coalition, we eventually form a Borneo coalition to take on PH on the ground of autonomy and eventually self-determination. Unless this party see a prospect in the federal power. So that's the first challenge. Second challenge is that a permanent coalition is a recipe for trouble when you win big enough. Or after elections, if your opponent decides to join you, I have described to you what happened in 2004, and I would argue the same thing could happen. In Slango and Penang, PH actually won 93% of seats. There's no way for them to reallocate constituency how to contest. Because whatever that you have won, stay with you. Which means the allies cannot find a way to resolve their problem. But the larger problem is really about how do you reward your allies for the contribution. I'll give you a simple fact. The line up in the, in, in the government front bench, excluding senators, every, out of every 10 MPs in PKR and DAP, three gets a job. But in Basatu and Amana, every eight out of every 10 get a job. This was a matter of contention at the time. But because of Mahati, everyone had to live with the fact. Now, what would happen if Anwas come in? The old representations of Basatu and Amana would have to be skewed down. Would this be accepted easily? The larger question to that, of course, is then, who is going to be the DPM? Now, it was very easy for Amno because that was the largest party. You're not happy, that's the way out. But PH, the good thing is that you have, you have no dominant party, but you also have no rule for competitions. So how do you deal with this? And I want to argue that overrepresentation in Basatu and Amana is actually justified in one way. Go back to Chintong's argument. Without Mahati to fill the gap of Malay leadership, without Basatu to pull that maybe the 5 or 10% gap, PH may be the largest opposition ever but they're probably not enough to be government. Without Amana giving some seats, they probably would have trouble too. How do you reward them? There's no solution to this. And so if you have an infighting, especially let's say if Basatu and, and PKR become big enough to take on each other, can you put forward a convincing government line up to assure the people that you can run the country? And here, I'm not pointing finger at all, and I would, again, I would advise against blaming the politician. It's a system that get people to do things may not, that may not be rational collectively, but they have to do so because that works for them individually. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Chinwa. I wonder, as an outsider, 
having heard your comments and trying to join the dots here, in some senses, what I've hit, understood is that there is an element of tactical voting in the sense of we want to defeat the government, but we don't necessarily coalesce around a common opposition party. And the electoral system is an impediment to the formation of a sustainable and durable opposition party that can command support. How likely, therefore, is it that there is to be the necessary or deemed necessary electoral and other reforms that might give, light, give rise to such conditions for uh, that sustainable opposition party. And I ask that because clearly in the context of what um, uh, Wing Tai was saying in terms of economic reforms, there have been, as you pointed out, the reform on GST, a courageous move mm. for, uh, for politicians to be courageous. That's, that's quite unusual. They play to the gallery. So uh, in that sense, for these necessary reforms, fiscal federalism to accompany the political federalism in the country, how how likely are you going to get the necessary electoral reforms that can give you the stability on then on which economic reform can take place? Chinto and I would disagree, lightly to disagree on this. you want to go first or me? <laughs> <laughs> we knew each other since 1996. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there are two major factors if we look into the future on whether this government will be a stable government. One is the political factor, especially between uh, Mahate and Anwar, and the forces aligned to Mahate and Anwar. Uh, I, I would think that both of them are very clear that they have to do the transition smoothly. Uh, they, they had this rare second chance in life, and this nation had this rare second chance uh, that after 20, 20 years. Uh, so I, I would believe that they want to do it right. Um, the last time we were supposed to have transition was uh, when Al Gore came in 1998, uh, when we hosted APEC. Uh, we're going to host APEC in 2020. But this coalition has its strength as well. This coalition is actually formed by parties which has a strong t tradition. The four leaders, let's, let's imagine that, let's look back over the last 50 years in, Mal in Malaysian politics. Mahathir, Anwar, Lim Kishyang, and Nick Aziz, the late Nick Aziz. These four personalities and the forces aligned to them, even at the lowest point of their political career, they had a following. So the political coalition that is formed today are formed by these four parties as associated with these people. And I think as long as they get the formula right, they will be able to, con because they do have a following, they do have an ideology, each of them. And the question is whether the ideology can actually find a common, common uh, purpose in order to work together. So this is how I see the coalition. On the economic questions, which is important to the coalition, is whether eventually this coalition can find a common narrative. And I think, now okay, this coalition is going to do very well in terms of institutional reform. This government is going to do very well in terms of institutional reform because we, had, we did have, have a consensus. Uh, we, our consensus was because everyone in this coalition suffer at the hand of a strong prime minister, only that Anwar suffered at the hand of Mahathir and uh, Mahathir suffered at the hand of Najib. <laughs> but everyone experienced a prime ministerial dictatorship at different point. So there is a consensus on institutional reform. And I think that the changes we have made over the last few months were very clear because everyone knew that we, we want to avoid the recurrence of a prime ministerial dictatorship. What we are going to face problem, and we have already seen, seen problem, would be in the area of the economy and on the questions of race and religion, on ethnicity. Because we did not have a clear consensus. Our experiences are very different. 
These are strong, very strong parties coming from different traditions and coming together to form a coalition in order to defeat Najib. So we are going to face problem and we will have to find a common vision on the question of economy and NACT. And when it comes to the economy and NACT, they are intertwined. Ultimately, they are intertwined because the entire argument against by, by the by the ANIC champions say from, from among past or um, no. Ultimately, what sell is actually, oh, this is a party, or this is a, what they call a government controlled by China DAP. Control on what? On the economic questions. Okay? So, moving forward, I think there is a need for this government to turn left a bit. Now, this is very silent. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm. Mm. Ultimately, we will have to understand that only when you have a strong bottom that everyone will prosper in the economy. Because since 2009, this economy has been heavily depending on, dependent on domestic consumption. And we are now at the tail end of the flying geese model. Malaysia and Asian country has been exporting to the US and has been seeing the US and the Europe as the final destination of export for the last half a century. Now we're coming to that tail end. How do we transform? How do we meet the challenges? It will mean that we will have to ensure that we pay Malaysians much better. The 1980s model was that we get FDI to come in and then we pay people, we pare down the wages in order to export. But today the challenge is, if you don't, if you pare down the wages, then ordinary Mal Malaysians have no money to spend. When they have no money to spend, the economy is not going to move. So I think there is a need for us to look into how to pay ordinary Malaysians better in order to create an economy that benefits the entire economy. This is not easy, but they are buffered. We have between four and six million unskilled foreign labor in our system. Uh, this four, between four and six million, depending on whether you include Sabah and Sarawak, depending on who, whose statistic you go, go by. But if we can reduce the number of unskilled labor, automate the, the, the economy, move up the ladder, reduce the number of labor, yet pay each of them much better. There is a way to pay the bottom better. So back to my 4E, equity, education, entrepreneurship, employment. If you see this in, in this context and you pay employees much better, and therefore it will lead to education, entrepreneurship, and lead to equity expansion. I think that will be uh, the way forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, do, do you want to come back? Yeah. Ying, Ying, right. Ying Mai. Okay. Uh, I would agree that in the best circumstances, if you can deliver economic growth and share prosperity, the voters probably would just think that, you know, that, that the election outcome is foregone, you don't have to think much, as how much they're going to vote for you, that's all. But if they come out, large, largely you're going to win. But economic reforms, as much as they can be, even, even when they are good for the country, they may not always be good for individuals. Mm -hmm. They're always winner and loser. And that makes political competition challenging. Because how do you make sure your opponents would not exploit mm. the problem to benefit themselves and therefore bring down something that is good for the country. I mean, think of it this way. I said, if you look at one of the pictures that goes around on the internet, there were people demonstrating, uh, they put a banner and say we are against I said because we are against racist agenda. I mean, it sounds very funny, right? You, you're opposed to an international conventions uh, to eliminate 
all forms of racial discrimination, and you think that's a racist agenda? Well. Yeah. Right. So, so we, are, we are caught in that situation. Coming back to the electoral system, it, it fundamentally comes back to one question. It's actually communal politics. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. We, we may like to think that multi-party multi competition is a good thing. But in ethnic context, this is not always looked at such. Why? Because you fear that, say, if your community is divided between different parties, you will be collectively weaker, uh -huh. while another community is politically united. So the fundamental question here is that how do you convince Malays, the majority now, that to have choices is a good thing, that other people would not take advantage? Under a first past the system, it's very tough because you tend to lose if you cannot coordinate yourself well. To do that, to, to allow have multi-party competition within the ethnic confine and still feel safe, you basically need a less punishing system. You need proportional representation. But the challenge to most of us is that this is something so new. This is something so complicated. You know, what Indonesians can do is actually beyond what Malaysians intellectually are capable of. Yeah, well, it's good that not, not uh, Nuru is on my side. <laughs> but coming back to the question, but I also see this is a chance. If we're going to have a PR system now, the most important outcome is to assure Malays that their political division is fine. They don't, they don't get punished because they actually have many choices. And it also works for PH. Because if you're going to shift to a PR system, eventually the party, the allies, could have a little bit of differentiation. They, with, they don't have to agree with each other all the time. That actually makes them more competitive against their rival. So Basatu can actually appeal to the Malay ground and eat away woods uh, share from Basatu. And Amanak may do so, eat away from uh, past. And they can still come together. But Controlling the old system would be tough. Uh -huh. How do we overcome this? I think we need to overcome uh, ignorance and initial. I'm not saying that, say, moving away necessarily would promise a solution to everything. Uh -huh. But I think it's important for us to recognize that the current system provides no assurance of uh, stability. I want to end my part going back to Chintong Point. Chin Tung talk, talk about uh, leaders with shared experience, therefore they can work together. I want to remind you, uh, invite you to revisit our history. The forerunner of Barisan National, the alliance, consisted of leaders with shared experience, with comradeship. They all believed that they should compromise. But what happened in 1969? Because when the government monopolized the middle ground, your opposition could only go to the fringe and attack you from the front. And that's how the government finds itself to be attacked. Because there's no way you can police people from both sides. We need to work on the society, but also think we need to fix the politics. And I would argue, going back to your early question, why uh, the tsunami is... is Given us, has given us this opportunity to move on, but it's not enough for us to be complacent. Because eventually you need to find a way for us to be very comfortable with differences among ourselves, especially differences among our core ethnics. It's to celebrate division. But this is tough, because we have been taught and say we are so diverse. If we divide, we're going to end up in riot, if the division is across ethnic line. But if the division is between ethnic line, then we will lose because someone else got united. They would, they would take advantage of us. To embrace political competition, division, is actually what democracy is all about. Mm. And I think we have a lot more uh, uh, rethinking adjustment to make. 
Okay, thank you, thank you uh, Chingrat. I wonder at that point if we can uh, pause just to uh, welcome the fourth member of our roundtable panel, Miss Anwar. You're very welcome. <laughs> and, and out in fairness to you, uh, Miss Anwar, if you would like to address the audience, I ha I, when I commenced the roundtable, I asked each of our contributors yeah. uh, a question in terms of what they what they offered as their analysis for the um, so-called electoral tsunami or earlier this year and what they thought the causes were that brought about the current government to power. So perhaps um, I offered them each five minutes. You can either do that from your seated position or use the rostrum, whichever you feel most comfortable. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to maybe be first uh, apologize for being so late. Uh, one of the key items of today, the last day of parliament, um, are the ongoing meetings that's taking place, specifically to create different committees, standing committees, parliamentary select committees. And this is very historic, because if you understand Malaysia, one of the weaknesses that we were faced with in our democracy um, was the fact that our parliament was often seen as a rubber stamp. Um, and there was no way for parliament to really emerge as a countering force. Um, you know, uh, a forum where you can check the decisions, critique and give useful feedback and not necessarily reject outright yeah? any sort of decisions by the, the executive. Uh, so with that, I, I think, you know, in terms of my participation in the JCI forum and New Malaysia Rising, it's not like I don't want to give many um, a, an opinion on why we won. I think we've gone past that now. Uh, many people would be, if you're a 1MDB fan, you would blame 1MDB. If you are um, you know, a fan of other factors, you would say it was an urban uprising. If you were someone from Kuala Kedah, you would say, I didn't vote for Pakatan Harapan at all, and look what I'm stuck with. So. It's, it's a very diverse range, yeah? And it also tells the story of Malaysia, that with such diversity on the 9th of May, we could somehow, not us, the politicians, I mean, I think we carried the, the lifting, but I would say um, most of the lifting was carried by the, the people because you really needed to drive the change, people coming out to cast their votes and literally overcome the extreme gerrymandering of, of which Chin Huat is an expert of. Uh, I think he helped me uh, provide sufficient um, documentation and, and, and evidence to back my challenge um, against the election commission yeah, to ensure that the constituency of Lembah Pantai at the time would not be grossly uh, skewed to, to fit the needs of the incumbent. So, I would say right now, I wish, I will start with this, my first wish is that kind of peaceful, um, measured transition that took place on the 9th of May. I say this because you will not find another country after six decades yeah, of the same coalition in power having a change without even a drop of blood being shed. So I think we are better than Indonesia. I, I have to say this. You know? I meant Indonesian voting. Sure, but the point is, it's not about we're living in, in, in ASEAN where big brother, small brother, hello, you're talking about a state, nation that is, has far more economic, wields more economic might than any other country. So I think that, that, that particular description doesn't really, um, you can't describe any particular country as being strong or weak. It's very different, it's very unique. And I do believe that Malaysia's story is unique in this sense. And I hope that we could emulate that kind of measured that kind of um, peaceful, including engagement from the current opposition. Because you can say whatever you want about Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Najib Razak. He did concede defeat. He didn't suddenly escape with a helicopter, you know, or aeroplane or private jet. I mean, he could. No, but the point is, the point is he did concede the win. I mean, I wanted to say, and that's partly because the stakeholders, the environment, the pressure points, even those from the ruling, uh, the previous ruling party, help bring about that kind of uh, change. So, if you push that forward to where we are today, I think that is also a lesson as to how transition must take place. You have this non-Bible, what is it called? The Manifesto of Pakatan Harapan. <laughs> it's nice, and they have these buzzwords you remember forever. 
Mm. That's a non-Bible, it's a manifesto, you know. Um, but the issue is when you have it, then it does also bring about a very kind of um, uh, drawn out perimeter, not much moving room. Because again, you're dealing with the opposition who have been opposition for so long. Of course, they took over power in the same in similar states, but there has to be that degree of focus in terms of what we can do from the cluttering of concerns and reform pledges that we have before us. There's so many. People in Felda expect different types of reforms. People in Tabung Haji expect something different. But guess what? People in Kuala Lumpur and Bangsa also want certain issues to be highlighted. Rights of the minority and so on and so forth. So you need to have a very measured cluster of priorities. And this cluster of priorities has to be intended to pull us together. Meaning, at every given moment, and I can say this because I'm uh, a backbencher member of parliament, uh, so, but at every given moment, it has to be, okay, how do I pull people together? How do I know? And there's no room for much mistake uh, because, again, it's Malaysia. You mentioned 1969. You know, um, I think we should take heed of what BN tried to warn us every single time. I mean, after a while, you know, I'm not saying every single time it is truthful, but it just helps to put into context what is it that we're dealing with. So moving forward, I think um, if we want this transition, this stability to be maintained, I'm not concerned about, um, um, you know, for example, at the end of the day, there's a lot of political goodwill for this transition. There's a lot of support. You, you look at even um, the management of 1MDB, the disclosure of many of the concerns, including the extent of debt. There's still a lot of support. We are very lucky in, in that sense, and I'm very appreciative. But by the same token, uh, we also have to be mindful that next few months, few weeks, the decisions that we've made has to be taking into consideration first and foremost our cluster of priorities, which is the people of Malaysia, and how do we reduce the divide? Not necessarily trying very hard to appease everyone. Because trust me, you will have different stakeholders. People will be demanding many things. But you need to understand that at the heart of it, what is that priority of yours? And that's what I think should be done in the context of legislative reforms. Thank you. Thank you, um, Isama. <laughs> At this uh, juncture, what I'd like now to do is um, turn to the audience and seek uh, questions. Um, I should um, make a plea uh, for uh, short questions, not uh, speeches, um, if I may, uh, in deference to others who wish to ask questions as well. Um, so if you can, um, in, if you do have a question, if you perhaps, we have a roving mic, I believe. And if you could raise your hand and pose your question, and if it is posed of a particular member of the panel, do indicate. Otherwise, I perhaps might ask uh, each of our panelists to offer a uh, response. So, yes, yes, sir. Uh, my name is John, and my question relates to the 4E idea that uh, YB Liu Ching Tong raised. And let me frame it this way if the opportunity to mobilize or unite is in fact available, it's out there because the goodwill is there. Pakatan uh, Harapan is in and needs to mobilize. Where do you find the opportunity? And my proposition is that local government elections is the opportunity. But sadly, we are framing it in the old dialogue of priests, which led to 1969. Reframe the dialogue. Make it possible for Parakatan Harapan through this election mode, not use party, partisan position, but some other way of restructuring power at the third tier of governance so that good governance prevails. I would like Chin Tiong to comment. Thank you. Chin Tiong. We'll, we'll take each question as, as they come. I think it might be easier. So, uh, Chin Tiong. Uh, I have always been saying that we need to reconfigure the three-tier government. Today, if you shut down the state government, no one will notice. Okay? But we have a three-tier government structure. And since 1974, 
the local government has actually been constructed as an extension of the state government, without which the state government would have no reason to exist because people won't notice it. What we need now is a debate to reconstruct, like for instance what uh, Wing said earlier, to reconstruct the three-tier government, to bring some of the functions of the federal government to the state level, so that the state government, for instance, has more control over transport. The state government has more control over certain level of education. The state government has more control over certain level of health care. Now, this is one area that we will have to deal with. And I think we will need to reconstruct the size of local government. Today, the current structure of local government, if you go for election, I would not agree. Why? The Shah Alam Council runs a budget of about 500 million ringgit. Subang Jaya Council runs a budget of about 400 million ringgit. BJ runs a budget of 400 million ringgit. The Slango government runs a budget of 1.5 B. Penang government runs a budget of less than 1, 1 uh, billion. The Burlis government runs a budget of about 100 million. So the six biggest council in the country, each of them are four or five times bigger than the Burlis government in terms of fiscal size. So what we need are smaller council with less power, with a lot less power, and they should go for election. We should have smaller council with a lot less power and we should allow them to go for election. So this reconfiguration of council or three-tier government is needed. And once that is done, uh, we should allow them to go for election in, in, as community government, community council, uh, just like the councils in Australia, just like the councils in many, small, many countries. Uh, they are small, they are there to govern community affairs. And back to what I've said earlier, we are essential, essentially an urban nation. And we have to recognize that. And once we recognize that we are essentially an urban nation, having local council election, really smaller, smaller council, uh, will help to make the urban affairs a lot better. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, Chin I, I completely agree with Chin Tung, but I want to add on one thing. If I am past an AMNO, I would say all this is just DAP nasty idea to take away Malay powers, to have the Chinese impose uh, becoming the overlord in the urban area. So I, I, for me, the reason why we have lost uh, ICERT and now temporarily on local government election is that our, it's because we have failed to articulate what concrete and tangible benefits institutional reform can bring to the Malays. This, this may not sound as music to many non-Malays, uh, to people who are much more universally minded, because they will say, why do we have to think about this? But the reality is that democracy, election, these are numbers game. People would actually have to ask, what do they have? So unless you can convince the case, you can make the case, it would not go anywhere. And I would suggest the immediate solutions, if you want to push this, is to show to the Malays that why democracy is good for them. We should start with village elections, JKKK elections, because at now all these are actually appointees. Let them have it. Spread the, the, the benefits of competition. And then when we talk about further changes, I would suggest let's start with Kota Baru and Kuala Tengganu. Let's show, let, let the detractors of uh, local elections show how can Malay lose power just because they have, more, they have power to choose who to run their city. We really should take the bull by its horn. Why should we concede the whole issues on communal politics to the... Uh, to the communalists. I think we have to recognize that as long as communal identity matters, that they decide to some extent your life chances, it won't go away. The only way for us to move forward is actually to introduce non-communal differences. 
we have to ask that question. How can Malay benefit from more competition? We, this is the elephant in the room. Without dealing with this, I don't think we are going to get very, very far. I think, uh, can I just say, say a few words? I agree with Chin Huat that we, we must come back to these questions that we must recognize that they are anxiety. We must recognize that they are anxiety. Uh, we must recognize that a lot of this anxiety has some basis. And particularly, the basis is in the economic conditions of the bottom 40% Malays. We have to recognize that. Otherwise, we will not get further. If we fail to recognize that the economic anxiety among the bottom 40% is serious across racial line, but particularly they could be exploited among the bottom 40% Malays, we will not go anywhere. Many people will say, oh, uh, we, we, don't, we don't need to deal with this because uh, we can, it can be less of that. Ultimately, we have to recognize that there are many Malaysians who are not living a good life. And if they are not, well, if they don't live a good life, and if all the changes that happen since May 9 do not lead to a bet the betterment of one's economic condition, whether you're Malay or non-Malays, if it doesn't lead to the betterment of one's economic condition, then it's it is going to be, we are going to be in trouble. And which is why I come back to say that we have to deal with the economic questions. Can, can I add a bit? Yes. I, I think, um, you know, talking about the how democracy should actually provide tangible results and outcomes for people, I think this is really crucial and makes the job of policymakers and, and government wannabes even tougher. Yeah, but if you look at what happened elsewhere, um, you can you can choose your you take your pick. You want to take Brexit, you want to take any other developments and, and changes. Many um, voters or, or ordinary people always see that sometimes the political elites between these countries have more in common with each other than with those from the uh, you know the socially challenged backgrounds, right? Economically challenged, sorry, backgrounds. And I think that's precisely the problem because when you have uh, pres prescriptions, and, and Jin Huat suggested some, we, I mean, I would say we have to be a bit more open. Sometimes it is quite a slam dunk. It could be PTPTN, for example. It could even be PTPK, which is the two funds governing youth from diverse groups. One's the academic route, the other one is from the technical vocational educational route. So even these two things already, you know, if you can uh, understand how, as a government, reform and democratization can be translated into meaningful outcomes through this program, meaning I can tell through my changes and reform that this person who's dealing with this loan will be better off. And this could mean even maintaining some of the programs that Barisa National did. I think, I think the issue, you know, we have to understand that's facing us, people were angry because of the corruption. So what does it say? Does it say that we have to negate everything that BN did? I think not. That would be my view. But I also would say then, of course, you don't have much room to make mistakes, but it means, you know, you can, I mean, this is the age of um, wisdom in the sense that many economies, many countries you can learn from, but also you can also localize the, the solutions to meet the, the needs of many. And Malaysia has done really well. I mean, we're not Zimbabwe. Um, and it's important to say that mm. because then you sort of understand, you have a relative understanding of where we are. So if you want to compare us as a pariah state, yeah, in terms of electoral reform, yeah, we're a pariah. I mean, in terms of electoral reform, we're terrible. In the gerrymandering, we're champions of the world, yeah? But in terms of economic well-being, in terms of addressing poverty eradication, I think we, we've done pretty, pretty well. Of course, inequality, etc. I mean, these, are, these things, as, as, as Jin Huat um, and Jin Tong mentioned, I mean, are, are issues to consider. So I would say, even local council elections, if we start thinking that, you have to remember, in the kampongs, they're so used to their JKKKK case. They're so used to it, you know? So you touch one JKKK or one JASA officer, you touch the whole family, you touch the whole community. So it's, it's not easy. I'm, I'm not saying that I have the prescription, but the point is that you choose your priorities. 
And sometimes if you think you talk about, I remember before we we're talking about IPCMC, my, my last point, IPCMC, oh, Hong Kong, we must have a moment where we allow them to be um, forgiven, right? This, this session for the policemen who are corrupt, there has to be some degree yeah, of absorption in the system. Can't you apply the same kind of treatment to village heads? You know who are AMNO sycophants? And, and this is speaking from my experience of being ousted from a, a, a rally. I, mean, I literally almost got punched when I went to a Felda village. But I still think, look, you can still win over. So that process, that transition has to extend beyond 9th of May. And while we find, sometimes it's very simple, the solutions, but you, meet, you must ensure that we have to enlarge the options, not necessarily through, through elections, because I don't think in terms of money is one thing, yeah? Uh, Chin Tong knows that we have the one trillion debt, uh, but of course some are contingent liabilities, but the issue is we have that uh, problem. We also want to make sure we have more investments. So we, help, we can uh, think slightly more about the more simpler policies to implement mm -hmm. that can showcase these are the concerns and this is our narrative in um, the post 9th May um, context. Okay, thank you. I wonder if I should ask um, just uh, Wing Tai if you wanted to comment on this question or can we... Everyone talks about the need for economic growth largely because that's the ultimate uh, justification for political legitimacy. And we come to that, it is very important to help the poor and what's the best way to help the poor would be that they get paid for what more of what they do. Employment opportunities and higher pay. And how does one generate that? The most important thing in employment generation for a country like this is the growth of small and medium enterprises. And small and medium enterprises, in order to foster its growth, we need uh, financing of their investment and operating capital. Right now, all of them have worse trouble than before. In 1997, after the 97 financial crisis, the government consolidated all the existing banks into 10 big banks so that we could supervise them better. But largely because there are fewer to watch, so we can watch them better. That was the, the reasoning. Many people wanted to ask questions. Yes. These banks, almost most of them became state-owned banks. The, what do we know about big banks and small and medium enterprises? All over the world, the banks that lend money to small and medium enterprises are small and medium banks. Mm. When they took away the small and medium banks, they took away the traditional financing of the small and medium enterprises. A big bank would like to make a $1 billion loan rather than a $1,000 million loans because the paperwork involved in each loan is about the same. So big banks like to make big loans rather than a large number of small loans. So when the SMEs got into crisis, what was the response of the government? The response of the government was to start a state-owned SME bank to help the SMEs. Putting a bureaucrat in charge of a state, that state-owned bank meant that the, the screening was badly done and many of the deserving enterprises did not get the financing they need and we ended up with the state, the, 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 we end up with an SME bank that's the highest default rate in the world. The solution was not to have another SOB, a state-owned bank. The SOBs are the problem. They should legalize again, issue more licenses for, so that the SMEs could grow. That's one. 
But however, the SMEs could pay higher wage only if they have to. And given the large amount of foreign workers here, you don't need to. And firms need not upgrade their technology because they can get cheap workers. So another way of addressing the problem of the poor is to take away the competition of the illegal migrants from other countries against our poor, the, the, the people who are poor. Another one more route, so besides SMEs and the support of SMEs by weakening the SOBs, they are the SOBs. <laughs> now, we, is that we have to give them the opportunity to produce higher value agricultural products. Specifically, what is the government doing to promote the productivity of the products that the people who remain farmers? We do not have a Durand Research Institute. That is a high earning uh, product and huge export market. In Shanghai, in almost every strip mall, you will find a, a durian cake or durian ice cream or a, a, a some, some kind of new dessert based on durian. But what I'm saying is, the way to really raise the income of the poor is either pay them a higher wage, that is to have the growth of the SMEs, or to make them switch, to encourage them, to empower them to switch to goods that they can sell at a higher price. And here is where the universities must be mobilized to help the farmers. What universities are seriously developing non-high durian trees that produce at a shorter period, less smell, all of these things are scientific endeavors. Just like how the rural America got rich Rural America got rich when the local universities came up with high yield corn and developed new uses for the agricultural products they produce. Hmm. What do our, do our local universities do that? No, largely because they are not controlled by the state government. The state government should tell them, if you do not put your scientists to work to promote the agricultural products of this state, your budget will be cut, regardless of what your QS ranking might be. Mm. Okay. <laughs> then we have final use. Yeah. I have more to say, but let me stop here. Okay. Minister, very briefly, because I want to try and get a couple of more questions. I just want to echo what uh, Wing said and just give you an example. See, you see uh, security, security guards everywhere in this country. And most of the security guards in this country are foreign labor. And many of them are actually illegals. This is the weirdest country in the world where you use uh, illegal migrants to guard your house. Against foreign, other foreign migrants. Yeah, against, against other foreign migrants. The Nepalese. The Nepalese. Okay. So, so how, how much they are paid? They are paid 1,000 over ringgit per person. But for corporation, they may have to pay them 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. They have to pay the, pay the companies that actually run these services uh, many, a lot more money, especially for armed guards. So since I came into defense, people ask me why veterans do not want to take up jobs as security guard. I say many veterans, uh, they are basic the, the least they can get from pension is at least 2,000 over ringgit. Why should they go to be security guards earning 1,000 over ringgit? But if you can take away the structure, that means you take away those licensing process that actually granted licenses to cronies and for them to hire, to, to be able to run those services, you change the structure and you pay, let's say you pay uh, a security guard 4,000 ringgit. Do you think the veterans will, do, will want to be security guard? Very possible. 
because with the 4,000 ringgit and another 2,000 ringgit, they become, they, they are earning middle class pay. But otherwise, they will say, I will stay in a kampung in Pahang and forever because. Wait for my durian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, those, those are difficult economic decisions that we will have to make collectively as a nation. We will have to step on toes of vested interests in order to change the structure, in order to benefit ordinary Malaysians so that they live a decent life. And if we can do that, big enough, uh, we will be able to see benefits for everyone. Okay, thank you. Let me go out to that lady there. Hi, um, I'm Liana. Um, while I agree that economic growth should be our biggest priority at the moment for Malaysia, um, I think the lesson that we can learn from the rally last Saturday is we can no, no longer and should not ignore the whole optics of race and religion. My question to Ching Tong and YB Iza is what are the current policies in place or possibly even agenda of the government to probably construct a national identity or to even counteract this kind of more race and religion and that's all you can talk about because this are what is going to hinder anything and any reform that this government is currently doing. Okay, thank you. I, I think, um, you know, I, I feel rather humbled by the, um, the outcome, uh, by the gathering. I think it's, it's, it's important uh, because from the very beginning, part of the discussion was um, that it was akin to the Malayan Union Movement 2.0. Uh, many people felt that way even before the rally took place. Um, and uh, for those of you who, who probably study Malaysia, I think, you know, I remember Malayan Union from the history books, but um, for many people, if they can, not us, but, you know, those who went, um, if they can rally and feel that it's not so much about ICERT per se, but what it represents, what it symbolizes, their larger uh, feeling of discontentment and, of course, uh, being maligned. As such, I, I mean, I'm still optimistic because the fact of the matter is um, you are seeing a different environment whereby uh, it's reminiscent of the Patla days. I remember when Hindraf actually rallied. So there was room. There was room. Actually, people were allowed to uh, publicly uh, assemble. They could uh, raise their concerns. And of course, that helped us as a nation to be better. I think we can't, um, the barometer of how successful we are cannot be who's in power. You know, sorry politicians, uh, it's a sad story. Uh, it's not about you. Um, it's about, you know, what kind of uh, system do you have? How much openness? And it really brings us this great opportunity to understand, hey, something in their psyche has to be addressed, whether it's through our education system. And that's like a five, ten year project and program. But you can immediately identify some of the key programs and suggestions that Professor Wu Wing Tai mentioned. Yeah, of, of course, there's many things that can be done, especially in Malaysia. Malaysia, whereby government intervention, we have seen, we have many welfareist-based programs. It, you know, there are many tools that can be utilized. And of course, I'm not saying that it's more flexible now that we have less money. It, it is less. It, it is much more rigid. But the point is, I don't think about the specter of race and religion. No, it's, it's a bit about, you know, People have been conditioned to thinking that Malay rights is central to our psyche and our reality. That the Malay position, we had to fight for it for so long, we can't let go. You know, so again, you know, you're just trying to empathize with the other. Um, the average pachi omachi. And of course, some are hateful. I mean, I, and this happens also in the US, in the UK. So it's not like something unique to Malaysia. You go to the UK, the same problem arises. You know, people feel that they've lost their jobs because the presence of immigrants, mostly Asians, have taken up everything. So it allows policymakers to just be a bit more humble. And I think the fact that they've raised it, demonstration was allowed, we were not, you know, the government was not high-handed, then we can start looking at it at a more, far more, how do I say, not, not just pragmatic, but a constructive approach. It's not so much, you know, okay, it's time now to basically lay blame. Look, at the end of the day, 
um, we can do things differently. And I think we have shown the capacity to do so. But time is not, uh, not in our favour. And, and that's why, whether it's dealing with past leaders or, or UMNO leaders, not just understanding their psyche, understanding that they have far more experience in moving the grassroots. Pass. Uh, they are holding daily charamas. Okay, I know of charamas. Charamas are only filled up with many people when PAS organizes them, usually, mm -hmm. right? So they have good speakers, they're very powerful orators, they can really wow the ground, and you just need to be quite mindful of. I remember Chin Tong uh, in, in the, the earlier campaign days. He's like, all Arno Ibrahim needs to do is go for a nationwide charama tour. Mm. Okay? And uh, because, you know, we were not given much room, but now with the television, etc., we have to be far more articulate and far more um, efficient in dealing with uh, Opposition 2.0. Yeah? Yeah. I did a thesis on PASS when I was at ANU. And I've always remembered uh, John, Fans John Fangston making this point. Say, since 1959, PASS would always have about 30% of Malay votes in the northern regions, uh, probably 10% to 15% in the south. Things have not changed. Past still have 30% in the north, which is fixed deposit, but the rest are middle ground. So, while I think ISAT is an important, or last Saturday was an important event, but we must never lose sight, it is Either the government can come up with a narrative and the centre can hold, and if the centre can hold, that would include also to hold the non-Malay ground. You don't read Chinese, I read Chinese. The, the sort of attack by ethnic media against the government is also a lot. The sort of uh, attack from, uh, from um, Chinese Facebooker, a lot. And it's in the same anxiety, the same sort of mood. It's a mirror reflection. The Malay sentiment that is expressed is the same, same sort of expression in Chinese by some of the fringe group. We are now at a period of time where I think the central narrative of defeating Najib, the common purpose is now waning. We had that common purpose, and because the center could hold for a while, now we need to know what is the next narrative that can hold everyone. If not, then of course uh, the pe pessimistic situation will come where the government will be torn apart by different sides, different, different. So you have the Sabah Sarawak nationalists, you have the Kelantan nationalists, you have the non Malay nationalists, you have the Malay nationalists. And eventually, this government will be torn five or six mm. uh, parts. Mm. But if the center can hold, mm. then the rest will not be a problem. Okay. I, I, want to, I want to add on a bit. Now, you, you can always think about how do we actually hold the center and so on. But if democracy remains a battle between the good and the evil, you are not out of trouble. You always have to remember the problem with elections, the problem I stress, is that there are always some voters who want to vote against the government. And they will vote for the strongest possible opposition, not necessary that they agree with them. So for, for us to have democratic consolidation, at the end of the day, we need a center that is shared so that the fringe forces would be marginalized. So at the end of the day, we have to ask and say, what are the opposition we look at? You know, we have to really define what are acceptable and not. And if we are not happy with communal divide, what's the solution? The solution is to encourage non-communal divide. Because with elections, with democracy, you need passion, you need tribalism. Otherwise, people feel that something is not right, right? And you do not want them to fall back and say, we fill in the, group, fill in the blank for your ethnicity and your religion. You have to give them something else. So we need to encourage a new divide, whether that's green, the non-religious green, the, the environmental green, whether it's red, class struggle, or, or what, purple, 
or pink. We, we need to encourage that. And so we, we must not think it's just really about how do they come about. I mean, of course, this is different because I'm not a politician. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I study politics, right? So I would have to put to you and say, we need to ask. Politicians have to do product differentiation. They have to show that they are different. What option do we give to them? You can't ask them to look alike. If they look alike, they cannot, they cannot attract votes. Then you start questioning, what's the point of having democracy when all parties look alike? Let's spoil our vote. Let me take one more question. I'm Ki yes, Tuan Chai. Uh, Jin Tong predicted that uh, uh, Amno states are numbered. As a layperson, I find it very hard to fathom how that will come about. So perhaps Jin Tong would be able to explain that. Um, I'm wondering whether that would somehow also include uh, the possibility of uh, uh, AMLO uh, MPs and members uh, en masse joining Bersatu and how Jin Tong as a member of the DAP, which is a, a, a part of the coalition of uh, Pakatan Harapan, feels about that. Also, I'm wondering, as a layperson also, I'm wondering why the government is taking such a long time to bring about the reforms uh, that were promised uh, during the uh, general elections. Uh, and okay. why, uh, for instance, uh, the, the Prime Minister is allowed to get, get away with saying no to local uh, municipal uh, elections uh, when it is uh, supported by uh, the other uh, component parties? How, was, what, why does it seem like the Pakatan government is responding to the protestations of the opposition rather than leading? And as you yourself have pointed out, in uh, the Chinese press, uh, there's a lot of uh, unhappiness about the way the government is uh, carrying on. Uh, perhaps okay. it's because 95% of the Chinese voted for Pakaran Harapan. Okay. Thank you. I am actually uh, more concerned. I was two parts of this question. We, as a Raya Malaysia, work so hard to change the government and work in Pakatan Harapan. Within six months, and looking at the, the forward, the uh, performance uh, of the current Pakatan performance, it was very disappointing. So my first question, will our Pakatan Harapan government able to survive in G15, or he will be boosted out? And the other thing is, what has the Pakatan leadership done to ratify their manifesto which the U-turn, U-turn cannot make, then they blame the previous government, which I think is the expertise of some of the DAP leaders. Sorry, Sadra Chin Tong. <laughs> and I put this question to all panel members, and as Sadra Chin Tong is his uh, fortune teller, he can predict. Thank you. Very quickly, I'm not going to do the defense for Pakatan Harapan. I just want to remind one important fact. When we talk about the, yeah, the people voting in a new Malaysia, new government and so on, do remember you are talking about 48% of the Rakyat. 34% of them voted to retain Barisan National. 17% voted for PASS. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that clarification. So, for, sorry, majorities of Malays voted for UMNO <laughs> and PASS. Yeah, so okay. they have to say that as well. Okay, so Ching Tong. So you win election and you have to govern for everyone. And we have to recognize that this is a multi ethnic society where you need to find solutions that are palatable to everyone. I think that is part of the problem. Of course, the second part of the problem that we are facing now is that we are still dealing with a situation where the media are still owned by the same group of people, although suddenly we have media freedom. The society is totally free. Uh, there's no more call from uh, Home Ministry. <laughs> okay, there's no more call for, from Home Ministry, but yet you don't actually have a Malaysian media yet. We have, oh, apart from, apart from, from Malaysia, Kini, and uh, the rest are, most of the media are a approaching issues from an ethnic point of view. So we won this election promoting a national Malaysian narrative. But there isn't that many 
national Malaysian newspaper from a national Malaysian perspective. Uh, this is where we are still caught. And following the, the next question, do we govern for Chinese or we govern for Malaysian? Do we govern for Malays or we govern for Mal Malaysian? Uh, this is a challenge. How do you justify it? So I think these are the challenges that we will have to deal with. And is the water's job ends at the polling booth or we're here to build the nation together? Are the voters sitting there with popcorns, watching people to perform and fumble? Mm. Or this is actually as difficult as defeating Najib. You see, when towards the end, before the polling, before polling, many Malaysians took it upon themselves, they have to do this together. They have to do this together, they have to say, okay, this is something that we are doing together. But once we are now in government, of course, they are not sufficient, we don't actually have sufficient mechanism for public participation. One of, one, one of the reform that we are pushing, we are hoping, is that the parliamentary committee system will be able to allow for more public participation. But without which, what do we do? Do we actually participate as bystander or we are here together to shape the narrative? Back to Tuan Chai, why I think AMNO will collapse. If AMNO continues to be led by Zahid and Najib, AMNO will have no future. Because if AMNO had any future before the election with Najib or Zahid, it would survive. It was basically dumb and threw away by voters, rejected by voters. Unless, say, someone like Kyrie say, okay, he decided to change the whole thing. But does he have enough support? And without a multi ethnic coalition, AMNO eventually will have to compete with PAS to be the ethno champion. Eventually, I think I will agree with Chin Hot, it will be PAS big and AMNO small, mm. and eventually that AMNO narrative will be absorbed by PAS and it will become a spend force. But that leaving a space if we do not do well, if Pakatan government does not do well, there will be a space for opposition party, let's say more green than the current government, more sustainable than the current government, a bit less but non-racial than the current government. Say the gov current government, if it is a bit more uh, to the right, then a party that is a bit left towards the government, there is a space. So I think eventually AMNO will be a spend force, PAS will remain a strong regional force, and nationally there is a vacuum for a new opposition party to emerge. Okay, thank you very much there, uh, Ching Tong. Uh, let me um, perhaps uh, bring move towards a close of proceedings with a final question to all of our panellists and that's to um, look forward and to ask each of you in turn to, to give three, any three of the key issues currently facing the government, the new government, three issues how they, and what they must do in terms of those issues, how they must get them right in order to perhaps win at the next general election. So. Who would like to perhaps have a... Well, because I, I had the privilege to look at the questions first. <laughs> so I'm prepared. Okay, I think the first thing is that you need to get... Uh, you need to economically empower the bottom 40% Malays. Ultimately, if you get that, then you can't keep pass at bay. Mm. Otherwise, you'll be in deep trouble. Second, you need to give Borneo nationalism a more productive and constructive direction. You can't suppress it. The, the genie is already out of the bottle. But uh, Sarawakian and Sabahan should look forward and say, how can we shape Malaysia to be more democratic, to be more uh, empowered, to be more inclusive, and so on. Take the lead 
and not just blaming us and say, well, we have been colonized by you, it's time for us to go out and so on. And this need uh, participation from both sides, from us and from them. And thirdly, we need institutional reform. A, a more thorough reform that many people investigate, like um, you know, doing away all this uh, communal-based policy to move forward to a universal society may be far out of reach. But if we have enough institutional reform to give chance for the all kind of persuasion, a fair opportunity to be heard and to win their space in the future, I think that would be enough to satisfy the urban middle class, the minority. So you basically need to think about these three things, PH here. How do you satisfy the bottom 40% Malay? It's Malaysian. And then the urban stroke middle class stroke minorities. If you can hold, give them enough things, then I think you can survive. Otherwise, uh, we might see very different things. As I say, one of the worst situations you can go is eventually this government will torn in West Malaysia by Malay Muslim nationalists led by PAS, in East Malaysia by Borneo nationalists, and uh, you lose the direction. In West Malaysia, this is, this is partly going back to address what Chintung talked about, the anxiety. I probably coined the word Malay anxiety, as Chintung did for Malay uh, tsunami. You see, that's a problem with the Chinese. They, they, they create terms that, that talk about Malay problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important to talk about the non-Malay anxiety, the urban middle class, the reformist anxiety now. It's important because when you understand what trouble you are in, you get less stressful. What are the situations we are caught in? I think we are moving closer in West Malaysia towards Sri Lanka, two-party system. In Sri Lanka, after the war and so on, you basically have the ethnic majorities divided. And only one side is friendly to the minorities. What does it mean? It means the kingmaker, the person who's going to tip off the balance, is no longer your median citizen, your median Malaysian, but it will be the median Malay. If you want to make this country, to move this country at least East West Malaysia ahead, we need to win the median Malay. We need to convince them there's a common future. And you can't start by slamming them and say, how can you be so parochial? Why can't you think out box? We have to recognize and say, everyone has their, their different upbringing, different experience that shape their worldview and values. We need to be empathetic. Malaysia belongs not just the 48% who voted in the new government. It belongs as much to the 51, 52% who rejected this new government. When we recognize this and we're willing to move the country together forward, I think we have a chance. Some people, for some people, their notions of the country future may not include us. But if we want democracy, our notion must include them. Okay. We don't have a choice. Uh, I just forgotten to address uh, Tuan Chai's point earlier about UMNO members. Uh, when Mustafa Muhammad joined Bersatu, I was very happy. Okay? I think it's actually, uh, most DAP members may not think the way I think, but I think I'm very happy to see UMNO disintegrate, and this is the time to do it. Now, except that we do not want to see an arm race between Bersatu and PKR in terms of grabbing everyone. But those who are good, those who are credible, for some of them to join, uh, let's say Kyrie joins uh, PKR, uh, um, uh, this, uh, what they call, uh, Mustafa Muhammad joined Bersatu, I think it's good, good for the nation. Because for them to stay, unless they are prepared to set up a new party and craft that space, otherwise, uh, for, what's, what's for? 
staying in Amno that is led by Zahid and, and, uh, and Najib. I mean, they don't see a purpose, we don't see a purpose, they don't function, they don't play a role in the nation. So that's how, how I see Amno. But I, of course, we do not want an arm race between PKR and Bersatu in order to grab anyone. It's not about grabbing anyone but it's to actually mm. grab some of the good ones and so that you, you strengthen the pool and uh, stre strengthen the coalition. I agree with Chinhua. Empathy is the word that I would like to use. Empathy should be the, the word. Without empathy, we will not move the nation forward. I mean, a lot of all this anxiety on the non-Malay side and also on the Malay side is because we, we lack empathy. We think that 9th of May is we have achieved 9th of May and everything should be rosy hereafter. But I think it is about building one step at a time and building that together and be prepared that that building process is at, as hard, if not more, than defeating Najib. And finally, I think institutional reforms are important. We should still go back to institutional reform because that will help us to build a democracy. For instance, reducing the age, voting age to 18 years old. For instance, redrawing the boundary. For instance, have a free media. For instance, have a, an independent judiciary. I mean, these are still very, very important, except that we must make the link. The end of corruptions, the end of cronyism means that the Malaysian security guards get a lot better pay. That link has to be linked, that reforms eventually will lead to better pay, better jobs for Malaysians. Well, you asked about three things, I think. I'll say three Same things one, that one other people have not mentioned so far. That's it. Yeah. The first one I would like to stress is the need to decentralize in general empowerment of the individuals, not and there's this decentralization to should go beyond the decentralization from central government to state governments to local government. The decentralization has to occur also in the field of business. The state, the, the state owned companies, the GLCs, they have not been great economic performance. They lose money, they tax their competitors so that they can stay in business. So the decentralization there actually means better income distribution by empowering the private sector in the form of small and medium enterprises. But for the small and medium enterprises to be empowered, we have to smash the state-owned banks. We need empowerment of the private, small and medium banks. The second thing beyond decentralization is that we need to have an education that is much better than the one we have. It is bad because we put too much functions onto it. We want it to teach morals. We want it to teach patriotism. What we want is them to be able to make the students be excellent in the particular subject that they study. The parents have a role in morals and patriotism, not just the schools. The schools can't be left. And when we talk about the schools, I had started off saying we need more good ideas. That's where the ideas will be, the capacity to generate good ideas will come from the good education system. But we cannot have a good education system unless we stop the brain drain. The World Bank shows 20% of people who get BAs from Malaysian universities live within three years. And this is not just Chinese. This applies well to the same to the Malays as well. You cannot educate good people and then they just leave the country because Things are bad, the, 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 the racial uh, situation uh, leads to economic policies that results in economic stagnation. So the, edu the third one besides the education sector is that the country 
has not just to be obsessed with self, but with its location in the world. I think that we stand the danger of being pawns in the new Cold War. We could well have some parties in our government, in the, some parties in our country, being pawns of other powers. And this kind of concern about the new Cold War does not only mean that we watch campaign financing, it means that Malaysia has to take a role. Mahathir has the, and Anwar has the credibility to pull ASEAN together to prevent ASEAN be the place where the big powers play their games. This, I think, the external environment will be just as important in determining the economic and political future of this country rather than just internal domestic reforms. But without the internal domestic reforms, even if you have got a good external environment, we would not be able to take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you. That was very uh, illuminating. I just want to highlight a few issues. The first is with regards to the national narrative. You have assistance given to past voters or Islamic party states and people who voted other than the current government, but without a national narrative, is going to be wasteful. At the end of the day, we have to be very sophisticated, you know, in terms of assistance, what's the story there? What exactly are you trying to say? How different are you? And how does it address the Malay fear or sense of victimization in this new Malaysia, okay? Um, and number two, with regards to even our zeal for reforms. I think this is the most important. People talk about a lot of things, local council elections, but at the heart of it, if you talk about the lower income group, one of the key reforms pertaining to TVET, technical and vocational educational institutions, you have so many in the bottom 40 group dependent on the funding, but guess what? In Malaysia, there are six ministries controlling TVET all over. That is not going to work. How do you make sure there's a unitary functioning body? Parliament then can be the, the main focus in managing these challenges and these reforms. And you can do it, and it's not controversial. But you must make sure by the same token, whatever assistance is given to fishermen, to the bottom 40 group, to the loan programs, cannot be stopped. Mm. If you want to, then you have to have a transition phase. People will have to be able to either um, graduate or have an exit uh, policy enacted, but it cannot be done in a way that they feel I did not vote for the opposition then, mm. therefore I am paying the price. This is important. I think we talk about reform, people talk about all the key big items and that's important, mm. sure. You know, but at the end of the day, if the basic level, the student who's poor can't go to college in Pera because the funding hasn't come in, close shop lah. I say this because I get inundated with so much complaints and I know once they get this assisted, if they have Amana Iktia Malaysia, they get that program running, you will not have an erosion mm. of trust. Mm. And it helps them first point, which is national narrative. And of course, the last bit is I believe, and I speak on behalf of my own self, in a no grabbing policy. I mean, we have to start being respectful um, that no government, no members of the executive can run their show without an able opposition. What do you want? You want to dissolve? I know what happens then. You want past to emerge strongest because I tell you that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Who do you think got the second largest share of support after Amno? Sorry, can you say that again? Pass. <laughs> I just went past. I, I just have to say this. You know, don't play. You know, this is serious. Amno has been there, if you talk about Golka, how long did it take before they lost their level of support at the ground? You think just like that, you can change. Of course, you know, it's a lot, mm. different contexts, etc. But we have to be clear in understanding mm. what is the impact. So the jumping has to stop. And I would say, you know, one of the, the important moments when the, I'm sure some of you might have seen the tea time session between myself, Rafizi and, and YB Rambau. And I think the key aspect of engagement in this democracy, in any democracy, is respect. 
the fact that at the end of the day you are meeting because you care about the future, but you're not there just to ask for people to jump. That would not just be insulting them, but I think it insults you. So I, I say this because I feel that one of the key things, and if you look at parliamentary debates, which is quite, you know, um, I think robust, I am also appreciative of the position and role of Ahmad Maslan, the member of parliament for Pontian. You know, he has steadfastly, uh, you know, stood up and, and, embarked, and, and engaged in debates, and I do not want him to jump. Uh, not to Kadila, not to Bersatu, please, stay in Amno. I mean, do your job. You've been in power for so long. I'm sure you're going to be a great opposition. And that's what Malaysia needs. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, um, Isamwa, for your contribution, which brings the formal part of our proceedings to a close. I'd just like to, on behalf of everyone uh, assembled here, to thank, first of all, our four... Uh, to, to thank um, the round table and particularly Dr. Ayer for um, agreeing to commission uh, the round table at, uh, at this point in time. And also to thank uh, Sunway University for providing such a splendid location and host institution for today's proceedings. But above all, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your um, commitment to the occasion on what is a, a holiday, I believe. So thank you very much for coming along this afternoon, for being such a patient audience, and uh, again, to wish you all the very best. Thank you. Okay, thank you.